Precious one, you are welcome to time with Archbishop Charles. I'm 40 years in full-time pastoral ministry this year and 40 years in a miracle ministry. It is time, even as I've entered the third phase of my life, which is my given phase. It said life consists of three major phases. You're receiving years, one to 30. You're acquiring years, 30 to 60. And you're giving years, 60 onwards. In this phase, I want to communicate and share with the young generation some of the things I've been through. Not only am I sharing in this documentary series, I've invited seasoned men and women of God who we've connected over the years to also share some of the things that will help the upcoming generation. It's very important. When I got saved, one of the things I did was I read a lot of biographies and autobiographies. It helped me know what God did with people, when he did it, at what age he did it with them. And so for me, this series is a very strategic and major one. And today, I have a very anointed man of God, a seasoned man of God, a man I have known for about 37 years. This man is no less a person than the former chairman of the Fountain Gate Chapel. He is also a seasoned agriculturist. <laughs> Today, we are going to hear from Pastor Clement Anjaba. Pastor Clement Anjaba, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Archbishop. It's nice meeting you. Here. Yes, yes. This yes. year, this is our first year. <laughs> yes. It's great, sir. It's good. Anytime we've met, it's been a blessed time because Amen. we go a long way. Amen. However, before we get into digging into our past, yes. um, can you tell us who Pastor Clement Anjaba is? Oh, all right. Well, my name is Pastor Clement Anjaba, as uh, the Archbishop has said. Uh, I'm a pastor with Fountain Gate Chapel. I was the former chairman of Fountain Gate Chapel. Uh, I'm still working with Fountain Gate Chapel. I'm a head pastor of the Orphan Corps branch of uh, Fountain Gate Chapel, which the, the church is called Gate Pastures. That's where I am. Uh, I'm married with four kids and three adopted children. Most of them are out of the house now, married, and uh, we are becoming grandparents. Uh, we are still in ministry, and we are doing that. This is the least I can say about myself. Uh, I think as we go on, you get to know many things about myself. Thank you. Amen. Adisho. Pastor Clement, yes. we met uh, in Tamale. Yes. Those years. Can you share a little bit about when we met and how the relationship mm. has been? Mm. Yes, I think I first met you in Bolga when you came to speak for Pastor Isu. In fact, you came to turn us from fellowship into church, so to say. So that was the first time I met you. Pastor Isu had met you earlier. He had talked to me about you. I had heard about you in Tamale. A young man is in Tamale doing some things, and, you know. You didn't so, say you were in Wa then. No, I wasn't in Wa then. Ward then. Okay, I was still in school. School, okay, in the university. I was still finishing <clears> up. <throat> I had finished up and I was doing a few things. So I was coming back home finally. Okay. When Pastor you told me that, so I came to Tamale. Uh, I came to Boliga. Okay. That was the first time I met you. Okay. And it was awesome and nice seeing you and the things you did. Then, of course, subsequently, I came to you in Tamale. Oh, that has been... So many other things, you know. I came to you several times. I had the privilege and opportunity to stay with my wife and my our daughter first time in your house. Mm. You hosted us. Oh, it was quite marvelous. And we met. And uh, I learned a lot because um, when I met you, in terms of ministry, you were far ahead. I was from school going to ministry. So I looked up to you and learned a lot because you were completely far ahead. You knew so many things about ministry. So for me, it was a great honor meeting you and learning. And I realized that in ministry, you just need to learn from people. And you were one of such people God brought in my way. And I learned a lot. So that is how come our, how our meeting in Tamale. Of course, there are other meetings we met and we rejoiced. 
Uh, I'll talk about that as we <laughs> move on. And, uh, and so the new things that came into, especially in your life, uh, I will never forget the one I just came. I was from Yendi. My brother, my senior brother was in Yendi. So I went there and then no phones those days. So I asked, they said, you were living in B team. I said, let me pass B team and greet uh, 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 those days we call him Pastor Charles. <laughs> I got there. You received me so well with the house. And the first information you got, you told me, it was a Saturday, I think. You told me that oh, you have just received new sets of drums. And we sat there. I said, oh, they should come and set the drum. Because I have never seen new set of drums before. And they came and set up these drums in the hall. We all looked at it. We rejoiced. And it was packed back. The following day, we all had to go to church and had to stay and be there. So it has been one thing after the other that opened us up to whatever God is using us to do. And Bishop, Archbishop, I beg your pardon, um, you have been that inspirer. We, I will never forget that. And I'm grateful to God for meeting and your wife. Thank you. Talking about the drums, uh, before we got those drums, yes. we had a certain set of drums. You want me to the, talk about the that? locally made yes. drums. We yes. call them <laughs> tamale made drums. <laughs> Bad guesses. Bad guesses, I tell you. And, 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 and you know, those, those were the ones you were using. So that was why it was, it was so much of a joy. No, describe it. How do, because those <laughs> drums, you know, tamale people just imitate, they try to do these drums like they do. And they tried to produce their own. And uh, they sounded not very good, but uh, at least it produced the sound you need. And you had that. And any time I came to Tamil, that's what we used. Uh, I will never forget the Ahuja speakers, <laughs> which, which served. Amen. And you, work, you walked around with date, Ahuja speakers, two mics, corded, and tangling you, and yet you were preaching. And I remember, you remember, those were the Ahuja speakers you sent to me in WA. Okay. And that's, that is the first instrument I used in WA. Mm. I was preaching with my mouth like that, no sound, nothing. We didn't have a drum. We only have a, had a conka. We clap our hands. And I came to you, you said, you have some drums to send to us. And you sent them to us. We received them with joy. <laughs> we received them. The Ahuja speakers, I used them on trahad. <laughs> also give them to someone when I got my own. But that has been the history. And uh, Bishop, you so began... So we, did, we didn't just happen. No, it, we didn't just happen. You know, um, many, and as we are talking, a lot of people will be, especially young people. Um, when you see people like Archbishop today, it didn't start that way. Tamale was a really dry place. And I believe I'm encouraging somebody. You just need to understand. It didn't start this way. Uh, sometimes you see them up there, you think they just got there. No. Bishop had to do many things in Tamale, including not having a car of his own. You know? And all this is where no place of meetings. We had to be meeting from place to place. He finally got a uh, 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 catering rest, rest house. house. And that was quite a beautiful to, and a high place. I even went to Zogbili. Zog I don't remember all those before, things. Before you moved. We graduated to <laughs> catering rest house. And, and at that time, that was very strategic. Yes. Because. Very, very strategic. I mean, when we went to ask for the cost of the catering rest house, and they told the price for a Sunday, that was like our three months income. Income. Before the church. Yeah. yeah. But we took a step of faith. Faith. You know, I remember that. And, uh, and uh, God it, honored it. Surprisingly, the first Sunday we moved there, before we moved there, I got my uh, top tight pairs. And those day, when I say top tight pairs, yeah. it's a drop in the bucket. Drop in the bucket. <laughs> but those were my top. I mean, they, they, I think the biggest of them had a motorbike yes. and then bicycles and things like that. But surprisingly, when we took the step of faith and met there, I told them to make extra contributions. Yes. I was surprised that the offering that came that day covered the place and we didn't need to take those extra monies from them. God was merciful. That is the story. <laughs> that is the footprint of ministry that God has taken, especially for me. I think uh, one of the things everybody must know about Archbishop's ministry is where he started. 
Tamale. Uh, I knew you were doing crusades in Samankesi and all those places. But when he started in Tamale in those days, there was no charismatic church in Tamale. You have to start by faith. Churches have to look up to you. Young people today who are doing ministry in Tamale, everybody knows that they passed through your church once upon a time. They left, and today they are doing. They may not be with uh, 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 Perez, Perez Chapel. Chapel, but they all know their roots. They know that you were an example, and they learned, and that is what I said. And today you go to Tamale, many churches, many churches, and sometimes they forget the whole thing. <laughs> but the truth is, your presence in Tamale really opened the spiritual atmosphere for churches to come. The whole of the north had been the same way. You go to Bolaga, it's the same. You go to Wa, no church, no charismatic church, I bet you about it. There were churches that were there. I used to call them follow-up churches, you know. Uh, what I meant by follow-up church was that most of the churches that went there, apart from Catholic, never had natives of the land in the church. So those days, if it is Easter, and uh, they come they home, come. there's no church service. Mm. But with, with your ministry, it opened up. We know people who are the gombers, who are kunkumbers, who are uh, uh, gongers. Talk about the other people. Who became the garbers, who became Christians, and were in the church. This is what I mean by spiritual atmosphere of the north. If you don't explain it, people don't understand. It was not that they were not doing anything, but God had to do something for the natives to belong. I mean, when I went to work, they tell you, in fact, when I was at the university, some of the people, the garbage from Upper West, they see me, they say, ah, where do you come with this? <laughs> you are a cliffy. Where do you come with it? We, we are Catholics. Catholics. Yeah. So I look strange. The story is not the same, mm -hmm. I'd be sure. It's not the same today because we are having even pastors from all over the place. Yes. And it's all because of some of the footprints you left in the north, especially in the northern region. So, Bishop, it's a long way. But we are saying this for some of our young people to understand that ministry is a path. And as you listen to some people's lives and read some of the things they do, it helps you to prepare yourself. I personally went to Dua very much unaware of what I was going to face. Except that I knew that God says I should go. That's where I come from. Mm -hmm. So I went in there. The challenges, I was quite apprehensive. But when I look at you in Tabale, and I look at Pastor Eastwood in Bolga, I said, no, me too, I'll stay here. And Bishop, that's it. I, 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 I remember often I would just come to you. In fact, when I started church, two of my great pastors today who are in the leadership, top leadership of Fountain Gate Chapel, they were with me while I raised them. And any time we were doing crusades, if I couldn't come, I dispatched them. Dispatch them to come and be with you and learn and see. And they are good pastors today. So the learning aspect of people like you in ministry, very important, very, very important. I will never forget when I lost my biological mother. Yes. Um, the other day I was going through my pictures and I saw you and Pastor Eastwood. It, it was the first time I was planning a funeral. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> when I look back, I realized that it was like, boing, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that was all I knew to do. But um, I thank God for the fellowship and the love you people showed me, mm. you know, for even showing up mm. to be with me around that time. Mm. Um, I remember some years ago, we had to go do a crusade in Wa. Wow, yeah. After you had left Wa wow, and yes, we were in Accra. Yeah. Um, and that time, the Wa airport had not been done. Yes. Uh, it was an airstrip. It was an airstrip, And yeah. uh, we chartered a plane. The plane. <laughs> We chartered a plane to Wa uh, to shake the city. I tell you. Um, from the reports I got, mm. it, was, it was one in a kind. Yes, yes, yes. You know, uh, uh, Archbishop, you know, I used, if you remember, I used to ask you, when will you go to Wa? Uh, when will you go to Wa? Uh? 
those days. Yeah. So when I got the news that you wanted to go to one, you wanted me to join you, what? I actually had to cancel other programs. Because for me, I was in Accra mm -hmm. now. But uh, for me, it was quite good. And I, I really, one of the reasons why I personally kept asking you to visit WA for a crusade or something was because I really needed your anointing to touch the land. I had left the place God had taken me out of town. Many things were happening. I was still following. So when, when, when we went, I remember when you, I came to you and you said, we are going by flight. Uh, you have chartered a, a flight for us to go. I said, wow. That alone in wow. I remember when we landed, <laughs> the whole town. The whole town was at the airstrip. Mm. Just to see. Because the crusade, the crusade uh, posters were everywhere, everywhere. into villages. Mm. And they said, we're coming by air. Mm. Everybody, young people ran from school and they were at the airport <laughs> just to see us come. Mm. And we landed and uh, many didn't know I was part of this uh, team. <laughs> and so when they saw me with you, they said, wow. So people were running and coming. They want me to see that, because I know some of them. They want me to see them, were jumping around. And the reception, one has reception of us, even though he was not well at that time. I remember yes, he sought yes. that you should pray, pray for him. him. Yeah. And you did that prayer in, in the palace. Mm. The, the Muslims were in the meeting like something because it was. And Bishop, you know, sometimes we don't realize, but most of those young people who, are, who were now senior men in the place had heard of you in Tamale. Mm. They had heard of what you did in Tamale. So they came to the crusade, and the crusade was one of its kind. Mm. It was the first time I believe people were seeing the gospel, gathering people to that extent. And, and the message, the miracles. Oh, I will never forget that man they brought yeah. on a bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, he rose up and threw his stick away. My friend, your waist. Right now, I command you to get up. Get up in Jesus' name. Yes, you are. Get up in the name of yes, Jesus. You Get up in hey, Jesus' name yes, you are. and walk to me here. Tell me what I said. Tell me what I said. Oh, give me yeah, cool for you. clear cool for the place. Give me. Me. Come up here. Clear the place. Come up here. Bring a stick. Tell me. Bring a stick. The power of the Lord is present to heal. My friend, come. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. And the whole place went. And you handed over the mic to me to speak in the gallery. So I had to now shout in the gallery, tell them what was happening. This is Jesus healing. And then they, they almost, everybody was almost trying to jump and come in front to come and see who is this man. So we had. We had to whisk this man onto the stage yes. for them to see. Mm. And that story touched the whole land. And so that crusade really, for me, uh, coming from that place and knowing the kind of things that are there, it really did a lot. It broke the back of Satan's work once and for all mm. and took the church, of course, that time churches were there, it gave the church a certain level of height for them to move because the name of Jesus was proven by the single miracle they saw that day, and then subsequent days, miracle miracles took miracle. place. Yes. And people were coming from everywhere. Yeah. After today, they talk about that crusade. Mm. So Bishop, that crusade in war, mm. not only the miracles that people saw, but the unseen things God did in the atmosphere yeah. for the upper west region. Mm. I can tell you since then, the number of churches, I monitor a lot, because okay. I'm very interested in what is going on in that place. Mm -hmm. The number of churches from here that are, there are people who don't even come from the place who have gone to start church. Yes. And the heavens moving. became opened. Heavens became open. Mm -hmm. So God used you to do mightily. And the work in Upper West has never been the same. It's never been the same. My brother is still a pastor of our church there. Okay. All the churches are open, they are still there. Amen. And I hear the report. Amen. I hear the report. Amen. So thank you very much, Bishop, <laughs> for offering yourself to be used in such a momentous way in Upper West Virginia. I, I will never forget that. Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and going there was expensive. Quite you know, expensive, yeah. The, the, the plane, the crusade, and everything. 
And the offerings that came will not be even one hundredth no, no. of how, what we spent to go there. Oh. But my joy yes. is that Christ was glorified. Amen. And the name of Jesus was Amen. lifted. You know, you know uh, 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 Archbishop, speaking about that crusade, telling you about some of the effects, especially the unseen one. You know, miracles, salvation, we saw it. We saw deaf ears opening them, dumb speaking them, that crippled man coming. So many miracles. But that unseen miracle of the atmosphere, which I am relating now, somebody said, well, why do you charter plane to go to war and go and do this? Those things can never be paid for by the money. Mm. You spent money mm. to get life saved, mm. to get an atmosphere of a whole region open, open to the gospel. Mm. And sometimes some of the criticisms about people, how uh, people spend money, people are extravagant, it depends on what you are looking at. Even a soul mm -hmm. being saved mm. with all that amount, mm. it's worth nothing. To God mm. in terms that money is nothing to God mm. in terms of that soul. Mm. So uh, these are the areas I believe that sometimes people who don't understand why people like you do some things you do or why we do some things we do, they speak. But um, when we begin to speak about the effects of what happened or what took place, the results, the atmosphere, the things, I believe that people will not appreciate what is it. And say, why couldn't you have gone in a bus and that, that? <laughs> I mean, a busy man like you here, when you did that and went on that day, finished mm -hmm. up and came, came back. back. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't come back with you, yeah. if you remember. <laughs> and that's because I stayed back to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to follow up and see what was going on. And, and it, was, it, was, it was such a marvelous one. Mm -hmm. So, yes, much money was spent. Amen. But souls were saved. It was worth it The all. light, it was worth mm -hmm. it. It was worth, worth it all. all. Worth it all. Hey, Pastor Clement, you, yes. you are one of the senior pastors that experienced COVID yes. firsthand. Yes. Um, some people said COVID was a hoax. Yeah. Some people said that there were all kinds of all things. All kinds of things. But during the period when you know you had your encounter with COVID, yeah. I, I was with you on uh, on phone quite regularly. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Uh, I got COVID in 2020, uh, 20, yeah. mm. 2020, November. Mm. I was actually in Upper West. Mm. And very strangely, I started feeling very uncomfortable in my body. I've never felt like that. Mm. And then I began to cough unnecessarily. I just didn't know. Now somehow, then the whole night I couldn't sleep. I was praying. Then I felt this could be COVID. Mm. I drove through because I wanted to see certain churches. Mm. I drove through the Chimai, Akumasi first, to the Chimai, and then I went to uh, Bole before I got to work. So when I got, when it got that way, I said, "Now this I would do it." So I changed my ticket. I, I, I quickly asked that they should book me a ticket to come. And then I came, I went to Tamale, maxed myself, and entered the plane and came. When I got to Accra, I had also done an arrangement to go and do a test, COVID test. So I, I arrived in Kotika. Then I moved straight to Nyaho, mm -hmm. and they did the test because I had booked. Then I went home, then I told my wife that I'm suspecting this could be COVID because of the way I'm feeling. So let me separate myself a bit. My daughter was with me. She too got it. Mm. So we separated a, a bit, and the whole night I couldn't sleep. So my wife was disturbed. She comes in, sees the way I was tossing around. So she called one of our pastors, who is the doctor who takes care of our family. He got in with this. Very, 6 a.m. he was in the house. He tested me and said, no, pastor, we can't sit here. Your oxygen level is dropping very fast. Mm. And that time I started breathing heavily. So we moved on, and we went to uh, uh, University of Ghana Medical Center. They kept me. They said we're going to test. And I said, well, I've done a test. I'm picking the result. Those days, it was 24 hours. Okay. I'll pick the result this afternoon, 12. So my driver went and brought the results. And it was 
positive. Mm. positive. Mm. And then they did a lot of tests there. When they, they did my chest x-ray, that, 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 that came and told me my whole chest was congested. Mm. So they have to move me quickly to uh, the COVID center. And I said, no, they should keep me here and treat me here. <laughs> or I, I disturbed them a bit. They said, no, they don't treat COVID. I said, they treat COVID and they treated ministers here. So they should treat me here because I'm a citizen. So finally, when the nurses realized things were becoming, st I was becoming a bit stubborn, let me put it that way, they brought their medical director. So he came and moved them and told me that they, don't, they no longer treat COVID here. So it's good that I go. And he said, they were sending me to COVID. I said, no, then let me make my own arrangement. And I said, okay. So I called a few doctors and they said, they have a place for me in uh, Rich Hospital. Mm -hmm. So I quickly moved. When I got to Rich, I was the worst case. Mm -hmm. This was what the doctors told me. There was a lighthouse doctor there. Mm -hmm. There's another doctor there. I was the worst case. He told my wife. So they kept calling. That's how I, I sent you the message. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's a message I sent. I think it was a message. And Pastor also issued also for almost everybody. Because he got the report right from the medi medical offices. Yes. And one day he said he was just there. The doctor called him and said, uh, you are saying your brother, but we, we, uh, Afro pastor, you are a pastor, so I'll tell you the truth. Then you better pray hard. Mm. And I was on oxygen. Any time you call, I remove the thing to, to talk. talk. Mm. Because I really wanted to talk. I just moved. He said, Pastor, don't remove. I said, no, I have to talk to people who can pray for them. So I kept doing that. And, and um, the church stood with me. Mm. I'd be sure. Almost every day, you mm. talk to me. Mm. And uh, so many people, people, pastors sent people who they knew in the medical center to come and see. The, and I was there. And we were in a room, a number of people there. I'll be lying there. Too. When I get up, this one is gone. Is this it one. discharged dead. or dead? No, dead. Mm. Bishop, dead. And you was. were the worst case. I was the worst case. But you were still there. Still there. And they were dying. They all died and left. I was the only person left in the place. Child. So that at the point, my wife was disturbed. My wife was always sitting at the hospital, morning from 7 to, uh, <laughs> From 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., she will be there. At meanwhile, you can't see me. I can't see you. Then she will come and be sitting there. I had this phone. That was my WhatsApp phone. Mm. And if you remember, that's why mm. you used to call me on. I only put it on music. Mm. And then I'll be listening. Sometimes I sleep. I get up. I'm struggling the brain. They'll come and change the oxygen. This one is not working. They'll bring another one. Mm. And I was there. But this thing. It's not a horse. Hmm. It's a real. It's real. You are, you are, that was when I understood this song, Goodness of God. Hmm. Every breath that I take. That I take. Hmm. Because you breathe and you, it's like you are breathing and they are giving you some of what you need. Hmm. But you can't get the rest. Hmm. That's how the COVID That's the way it is. Hmm. You, you pull in the air and it's like it's finished. Hmm. So you know you haven't had sufficient air. Hmm. But the little that must go, mm. you force it go. Mm. And so you are quickly trying to get more. Mm. I don't know how to describe it. It's like you are suffocating, mm -hmm. sort of. And the pain in the body, mm. you can't sleep. Mm. But of course, that was where other things come in. Okay. And the doctors told me that most of the times, if it's just that only thing, they can use the oxygen to sustain you. Mm. But all kinds of things within your body, because your immunity is gone down, Ghana. come up. Mm. I told him, I've never had a problem with sugar. He said, my sugar was somewhere. Pressure, somewhere. Mm. So for me, it was the two things they were battling. Mm. I'll be lying down, they come and say, Pastor, your pressure is too high, we have to do something. Mm. Your sugar is too high, we have to. Then they'll go and ask my wife, I said, man, does he have a sugar mm. problem? Mm. Then they were battling with me, come and give me this injection, give me this injection. Mm. And of course, I, I really struggled there, mm. but every day I so. saw. One thing that I, I thank God for, somehow I don't know, and I believe it's a prayer. In my heart of heart, I knew this. You I was no way. I won't go anywhere. Mm. But I, when I lie down, I'm going nowhere. Mm. I'm coming back. Mm. 
and it was so strong in my heart. Mm. My mind never wavered my heart. I was so strong in that. Mm. And I believe because that, that persuasion that you shall not die yeah. mattered a lot. Now, when you came out, you said something to me. You said the doctors told you that now that you have come out, it's another battle. Yes. Because now when you, when you wake up, you are weak. So can you kind of... Yes. Because <laughs> you know, the COVID, after COVID effect, mm -hmm. it's one of the things Pastor Isu talks to me almost every day. Mm. Mine is a miracle. I don't mm. know how. Okay. I came home. I was still struggling. Mm. As, as if it's gone, it's not gone. I had to buy my own uh, uh, oximeter and uh, think I come down, go up. And I called the doctor and said, oh, okay, so it's all right, you rest, don't do my things, get up. So, but you, you, you keep, you get up, you're tired. You don't know what you're tired, you're so tired. You pick a cup to drink water, and it's, it's like it's so heavy. Mm. So I was going through that. But the other thing I started, this time I started scrolling a bit on WhatsApp. Mm. And I saw my church members were not believing all the story they were telling them in the church because my wife wasn't going to church. Mm. She was always with me. So they were not believing. They tell her, oh, Pastor, so then this, man will, this man will put some. That's at what my wife said. That people don't believe you. that you are alive. That, <laughs> that I'm so strong <laughs> and that I've come home. They don't believe it. So one Friday, I just said, I said, I was just there, don't rest. Let me, let me go to church and show myself. Then I called Pastor Isu and I said, I have to go to church. He said, can you? The doctor said you should. I said, okay. I'll just enter for 15 minutes and come out. out. He said, okay. <laughs> so nobody knew. So I got up that day, dressing up. There's one story I'll tell you about the COVID thing. I dressed up. We went. They were worshipping. So my office, I can enter through my back door. So I entered and I lay down on the sofa. When they were finishing worship, then I told them to sing the song, The Goodness of God. So my daughter picked it up. Then I appeared. The whole church, crying, falling down. People were lying down, rolling. I was standing, I didn't know what to do. So I joined the choir. In fact, climbing up to the stage was a problem. They had to hold me to climb. Then I joined the choir, sang the song, picked up the song myself, sang the song. I think that was the breakthrough of my life. Mm. Mm. Whilst I was there, I felt strong. My talking. So I told them, look, I am supernaturally touched. Mm. I can preach even as I stand. Mm. Then my wife whispered, no, let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> but Thank God for our wives. <laughs> something happened to me that day. Okay. In the church. Okay. The way they were lying down, some were crying, some were shouting, some were rolling. So I sang the song I finished, and I told them, I just want to show myself to you that God has done it. Mm. So uh, I just came to do that. And finally, I said we were being there for 15 minutes. We ended up being there for about 45 minutes. Mm. I was on the stage for more than 30 minutes. Mm. So I went back home. I got home. All the wickedness and everything left. So the doctors were following up. They come to me. Just recently, it they means said that there is something about the corporate anointing. Bishop. That and even bishop. without prayer, even without prayer, the power of God. Power. And, that's why, and that's why people must not sit at home. They must come no, to church. No, 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 no. It's very For important. For me, when I got there, the whole church started. Because they didn't know I was coming. Mm. Only three people knew I was coming to mm. the church. Mm. When they started jumping, he, 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 shouting, something broke in the atmosphere. I stood there, and I think mm. the glory of God just landed mm. on me. Everything left me. Mm. Since then, mm. I'll be sure. That's how I come. Mm. The doctors tell me a lot of the effects people have. In fact, two of the doctors who treated me, uh, the lighthouse bishop who is now on missions in mm. Uganda, and then another doctor, the doctor Adipa, mm. very popular in that place, um, and some of the uh, pharmacists who were this COVID, the pharmacists were there medicating mm. on routine check mm. to make sure that they give you the right thing. They came to my church on Thanksgiving Day. Okay. Okay. 
the, one of the doctors broke down in tears. Mm. Mm. He said, my case is a case they cannot understand. Mm. Because they uh, were expecting mm. the progression. Mm. But it became evident mm. that I'm so touched by God and I'm healed completely. Mm. So Bishop, that is a thing. Bishop, during the COVID, there's one thing about the COVID people don't know. You know, when I was getting a bit better, mm. one day I got up and I told them, I, I used to get up and walk around. Then when I'm feeling dizzy, I quickly go. One day the nurses came and I told them I want to shower. <laughs> they said, Pastor, you can't. I said, well, I'll just go in quickly. And they said, well, you can't be out for about 30 minutes. I said, I will get to 30 minutes. So one of them held me. Up. And when you are walking, they will be walking by your side. I got that way. I went into the shower, got my things out. The man asked me, can I? I said, well, I'll try. I went down, did it. Went and poured water on me, finished. I wore my pants. I took my pajamas to wear. Let me stand and demonstrate what happened. I went this way and I remained there. Mm. I couldn't get up. Mm. I don't know what to do. Mm. I was there. But you see, wherever, whenever you are somewhere alone, they keep asking, are you okay? Mm. Are you okay? Mm. Because they know what can happen to you. So the man was not hearing from me. Then I shouted, I said, nurse. Mm. The speed with which he came, mm. I was bent. Mm. I could not raise myself up. So what he had to do was to force everything up and to quickly lead me. But when we got to my bed and they put that thing on me, I slept. I don't know when. I, I think when they, they immediately they put on me, I was, I was asleep. So they stood around me thinking perhaps. You were gone. I was so tired. I was just so the tired. Act just of buffing. That, that act of buffing. I was so, so tired. <laughs> so since then I said, no, I'm not going anywhere again. Okay. Let me wait here until. <laughs> That was, I think, about the 13th day or something. And uh, miraculously, my discharge was even a miracle. Amen. They just Amen. came and declared, look, Pastor, we think you can go. We thank God. Yes, but Pastor Clement, thank you very much. Amen. Uh, Pastor Clement, before we conclude, yes. um, you've known my ministry. Yes. Um, you've, you, you know the, you know, part of the beginning and where yes. we are now. Yes. If you want to say something about my ministry to young men, what would you say? Well, with what I know and with what I can tell from my, my spirit and my heart, I think your ministry came to raise a lot of people. Uh, there are a lot of people I meet who look up to you, who submit their ministries. They are not Perez Chapel. Perez Chapel, but they submit their ministry to you. And you ask them, ah, where do you? They tell you, oh, once upon a time, this is that happened, that, that, that. So your ministry, I believe, came to raise a lot of people, and it has raised a lot of people in ministry today. And as I talk, I still believe that people like that, God did not bring you into his life for nothing. Even if you pass through the church, I think you should continue that relationship. That is what has kept the top men in ministry, like him, uh, Pastor Eastwood, uh, Dr. Otabel, they have maintained the relationship. And I think the young people have to learn that, that when you, you come through a man and you begin to learn something, make him the model and somebody you learn from. And that will help you in ministry. That is what I also noticed that you are, your ministry has broken a lot of grounds. Especially when I look at Northern region. You went into that place and you broke the ground. And sometimes people who break the ground, they just break the ground for others to come in. And so Paul said, Planted uh, Apollo's water. Apollo water. And, and then he Cause said, some people too have harvested where they have not sown. So, mm -hmm. It's very important for us to know that God can make people groundbreakers. And I think Archbishop, your ministry is one of such. One of such. Even coming to us, founding a chapel, we think that your relationship with Eastwood was one that hastened our move from fellowship into church. And that was a great move in our ministry. So that is one. I also think that your ministry has given a lot of credence to Christianity in Ghana. Everywhere. Credence in the sense that the miracle working power 
prove to people to believe in the gospel of Jesus because they can see tangible miracles. I will not forget uh, your 30, 35 years, 35 years at the Independence at Square. Independence Square. Mm -hmm. This soldier man, okay. a Muslim, okay. who had this accident and came up. I mean, the way he spoke boldly. I was crying. Huh? Was crying. Accidents last year, moto accident. Uh -huh. He could not stand like this, he could not walk. For, for how long now? February is exactly one year. February oh, is one, one year. year. And after, the, after the surgery, they said three months you should walk. You I'm couldn't nurse. walk. I'm a nurse. I so knew I, I, I should walk. A military you. nurse. And you knew you should walk. This is how you came. Oh, oh about the, the soldier man is crying. Give the so Lord a mighty clap of praise. Oh, that's that Raoul. Okay, Raoul, show me how you came. Show me how you came. This is how you came. This is how you came. This is how you came. Now give me the sticks. Give me the crutches. Now let's go. Oh! I mean, it, it gave credence to the gospel that the gospel of Jesus is the message people must listen to. And, 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 and that is one of the things. And, and Christianity, credence to Christianity, that Christianity is the way people must go. In the north, that was one of the messages that went out because people who came into your ministry and saw the miracles and the healings and the proceed, the things that happened, just knew that Christianity was different. One other thing I will, I will, I will say your ministry helped to shape Christianity in the north is that, and this is not to say that uh, Catholic Church hasn't done anything. Catholic Church has done so many things. They've been able to keep the name, the name of, of Christ. Uh, when I went to Israel, I really thank God for Catholic Church mm -hmm. because I realized if they were not there, most of the sites mm -hmm. would have been yeah. missing. missing. So that is not to say, but at a certain level, people's lives in Christianity have to go to a certain level. And I think your ministry helped to do that for most of the people in the north who, quote unquote, were Christians, and yet they didn't have something what I call the practical experience, experience of Christ. It opened them to say, oh, okay, so this is what I'm playing with. This is what I'm joking with. I say I'm a Christian, but I don't know that the power in it is like this. So they woke up. And to be very frank with you, I know people who are in the Catholic Church in Upper West, who because of signs and wonders and miracles have changed their lives in some way. They now believe that this thing is, either to some people go to church, still visit, I when know. they want power, <laughs> they go to that. But now they know that, no, I can get the power in the, the church. church. And people can pray for me. And we had several of those people who come to our meetings. They were still in the Catholic Church, but they would come to our meetings and say, Pastor, pray for me. Pastor, this is happening. I, want, I need prayer. And that's because the miracles in the crusade gave credence to Christianity as the way of life. I don't want to call it a religion, but a for your sake, as the religion, they should really hold on. So many of this. So apart from the people you have raised, apart from the grounds you have broken, this is one of the things I personally believe. We used to, we used to call you I don't know whether you, you've heard people call you that before. We used to call you the Benihin of, of Ghana. Okay. Uh, that, that was a, 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 a name we gave to ourselves within founding the chapel. Okay. Said the Benihin of Ghana. I mean, because miracles were introduced into our, our lives and Christian lives, I think through the ministry God has given as a, an apostle he has raised in that aspect. So you've touched a lot of, a lot of lives. The, the, I, want, the, okay. I want to say this one thing. There are a lot of Northerners today who are very committed, especially when I talk about the Dagabes, who are very committed. And they are doing wonders, and I'm always grateful. When I look at a number of them, I trace them to your ministry. They are friends to me, we still talk, we do. But I trace a number of them to your ministry. And for me personally, that's one of the things I acknowledge so much. Because Upper West is dear to my heart. Amen. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Amen. Pastor Clement. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, before we go, one of the things you've proved is that you don't have to be number one. 
to have impact in ministry and to be successful. Now, the building you have built at Ofanko is a mega church anywhere in the world. I mean, I've been privileged to speak there, apart from seeing it. And amazingly, you put it on a hill. And a city on a hill cannot be hidden. But that is an awesome work. I mean, I, I, I'm into building, so I know what it takes to build something like that. But you've proved that you don't have to be number one. You are not the number one in Fountain okay. Gate. Yes. Um, you've, you've supported Pastor Eastwood since I've known you. And uh, you've, you've gone around the world. In this country, um, you hold your own. Um, you know, for young men out there, I want you to say something about their understanding that you don't have to be number one yeah. to make impact. Yeah. Bishop, women. that is, that is, that is a, a, a great observation. I think that's one of the big problems we have uh, with our younger generations. And uh, Like Bishop said, I'm not the number one. Uh, Pastor Isu, uh, we were in secondary school together. He was my junior, one year junior to me in secondary school. Uh, we were close in secondary school because he used to come. But Sisu has always been someone who wants to learn ahead. So he would come to the seniors to learn. And I was one of the people, because of science, he would come to me. Um, but when I got born again, I got born again after secondary school. He didn't see when I got born again. And then I also never saw when he got born again. Then we met at the university. I was told he was in the university and that he's giving his life to Christ. I was going to help him. That's what I thought. Because I got born again two years before him. But when I met him at the university, we became very, he too had heard that come. We met, fortunately, we were in the same hall. We met, we talked. And he said, oh, he had heard I'm born again. But I went and he was doing so many things ahead. There I realized that the man has something God has put on him. The number one thing I had to agree, he's younger than me. He was my junior in school. I gave my life to Christ first. But when I saw the things he was doing, I decided to help him. To, to be under him and to help. Uh, fortunately, I became the secretary to the, to, the, to the fellowship. He was the president. So I worked under him for some time. And then our vision started coming. The vision started coming and we were supporting it. What I told my wife when we met, and incidentally, my wife was one of his, his converts mm. in Upper East. When we met, I said, your father is younger than me. I got born again before him. But I can see something that is on him. So for me and you, let's submit ourselves. I used to tell my wife, and Bishop, this is my statement. I used to tell my wife that it looks like Pastor is 20 years ahead of me in terms of the things of spirit. So let's be here. Let's work with him. Let's be under him. I think uh, uh, John the Baptist said it. I'm not him. You just know you are not him. And you can never be him. Um, when God sends you to a place to work, identify who you are working with. So John the Baptist's ability to submit to Jesus was because he knew that I am not him. But who are you? I am one making noise. But he who comes is greater than me. You just have to know it. I think that is where if a man raises you, you may carry some anointing and do many things that may look. My building is bigger than Pastor building. But that has nothing to do with the anointing he carries. Mm. So once you identify that, then you know what to do. The other thing we, we have to learn, a lot of us surrender, but we are not submissive, and we are not yielding. After surrendering, you can surrender. Everybody will see. For example, when we go to war, and they capture <laughs> enemy soldiers. They surrender. Yeah. But you know that when a man surrenders, even if he gets you, he will kill you. He will kill you. <laughs> I think we must go beyond the surrendering to submitting and then to yielding. Mm. Yielding comes to the place where obedience is number one. Mm. There are things when Pastor says, I may not agree with him, but I tell my wife, let's keep praying. 
if it is of God, it will be. When he was moving me to Accra, it was quite a battle mm. for my wife. But as for me, when we spoke, because I've always, I, I used to believe that God was sending me to the Dagabas. Mm. So that's what I'm, I'm going to be. But when he analyzed the whole thing and told me, I said, please, if you think that's the best, I'm ready for it. Mm. They said, well, that, that's what it is. Today, as I sit with my wife, we believe that it was of God. Mm -hmm. But before, it was not. <laughs> you know, we thought otherwise. So sometimes, and what I tell people is that it doesn't take two people to lead a ministry. Mm. It takes one. The rest of us will have to support. That's the way God does it. That's the way God does it. I tell people, if you go to somebody's private company to work, even though Christianity or ministry is not private, you will see this particular principle there. So um, that's what ministry does. Ministry is led by one. Anything that is led by two people, two heads, it's a monster. It's one head. And sometimes the head where he sees, you cannot see it. So I don't argue with things I do not agree with, with Pastor Isu. I don't. I submit my thing, put my thing aside, and keep praying for him. There are times Pastor Isu will go and tell you, oh, but I think this thing, we shouldn't have gone it like that. Once it is his decision, it worked for us. But if I had opposed it, it would not work for us. So I, I, I think that is one thing. And the understanding that we cannot all be the leaders of the ministry. One person must be, and we will all have to work. Everybody find your level. And when you find your level, God will honor it. I think one of the things God has done for me, which I'm grateful, is that when he gave me that heart and that understanding, and I submitted to it, he honored what I did. I never do anything beyond or, or against what he says. I deal with my heart. Let me tell you this. Everyone who is a follower, what will help you? It's your own heart. Deal with your heart. And all other things will not be able to, have, to affect you negatively. The truth is, find what God has put you in the ministry to do, and you'll be satisfied. If you try to do what you are not supposed to do, you will never be satisfied. That's why you have your problem. I wasn't even the number two to Pastor Eastwood. Because Pastor Eric, whom okay. you know, was the number two. Okay. Okay. I was three, four, somewhere there about. But gradually, I became number two because when he was handing over, I took it. But I still honor Pastor Eric. I just went and visited him in Navrungu, okay. my wife and I. You see, honoring a man has nothing to do with your ministry, whether it's small or it's big. God can give you an anointing. It has nothing to do with that. That is why it is said by many people that uh, uh, Elisha did twice, <laughs> because they tried to count the miracles. Uh, but twice the miracle doesn't make him have the higher anointing than Elijah. Elijah. So when Jesus appeared, it was Elijah who was with Jesus, not Elijah. Mm. So, but Elijah, Elijah did his work. Mm. And I think that is where our young people have to know, that God will give you somebody who will have to raise you. Never try to go ahead of the person. It doesn't work. You may not see what the person is saying, but if you believe it, God will honor it. God will make you bigger in your own room. So uh, there's nothing I'm doing over there I don't even discuss with Pastor Jesus. I discuss it with him. I built him plan. I took it to him. He prayed over it. Amen. So Amen. You, you, that's what I believe we should do. So that God, you can be down there and still be who God Thank wants you. you to do. Because when we go to heaven, it's not what we have done. God will ask you, what I ask you to do is not what you went and did. I put you here to work like this. Did you do that? It's not about you went and did something. Pastor That's Clement, I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pastor Clement, you, you've been a great blessing. Um, thank you for making time to be with us. Thank you. Thank and you. to share your experiences with us. We appreciate your ministry, Amen. and we are looking forward to the years ahead of you Amen. and you making more impact Amen. in your generation. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you very much, much Archbishop. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Amen. And I believe that this will bless the body. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen.
Precious one, it's been a great time with Pastor Clement Ancheba. I know that you are looking forward to the next episode. Join me same time next week, God willing, and your life will never be the same. Jesus loves you, and I do with the love of God. Thank you.